Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome. Uh, we are thankful for each one that's here and for you taking the time to listen to this lesson. Uh, I want to say thank you to Will for the scripture reading. Uh, thank you especially to Brent for leading songs. And that last one, Oh, the Things We May Do. Uh, that is a, an especially beloved song, one of my favorites. Uh, and I think it's important for our lesson today. Uh, today's lesson is called, None of Your Business. Uh, and what this title is meant to reflect is the attitude that a lot of people in society have, but I think it's also an attitude that I see in myself, uh, and I don't like it. Maybe you see the attitude in yourself as well. Uh, because we live in a society where people want to be totally independent. Uh, now, I know we're, we're brainwashed to think that independence is always a good thing. That's not the case. Uh, you know, the way God designed the church and our relationship with God uh, is not to be a system of independence. There's a big problem with that and when we think that way. Uh, but people want to, to answer to no one, to be their own master in this life. And you can see how that leads to problems, especially if we would try to serve God on our own terms or to approach the master of the universe, our creator, with that attitude to say, I'm totally independent, I don't need you. Uh, and this is seen in a lot of different ways. Uh, but sometimes when Christians have this attitude, uh, they kind of attend worship services casually, uh, whenever they want to. And their life outside of the worship service is really based on their desires, uh, based on however they feel in that moment. They live however they choose. Uh, you know, is this a sign of the times? Is this something in human nature that's inescapable? Is this something that you and I can and should address? Uh, well, when a concerned brother or sister comes to you uh, and says there may be something questionable in your behavior, how do you react to that? Uh, you know, human nature, immediately we put up walls. We're defensive. You know, say, how dare you question something I've done or a decision I've made? Uh, but is that really what's going on? We'll look a little deeper into the problem. Perhaps something is wrong. Perhaps our, our behavior has gone astray. Uh, you know, our tendency is to answer this concern, brother or sister, and say, that's none of your business. But really, at the heart of the matter, we need to see their love. We need to see their concern and their willingness to help. But this doesn't just relate to how we would talk to each other. Ultimately, it's how we talk to God. How do we relate to God? And there are a lot of people who live today saying, what business is it of God's? What decisions I make or how I choose to live? I'm the master of my own destiny. It's my life. Let me live it. There are a lot of problems that are ingrained here, and to whatever extent we might adopt this attitude, it needs to be addressed. Uh, we want to examine this issue according to God's Word, and we start with Romans 14. Uh, the greater context here has reference to eating meat that has been offered to idols, but I want you to see the principle that's presented in verse 7 and 8. Romans 14, verse 7 and 8 says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Uh, now, you might paraphrase verse 7 to simply say, no man is an island. Uh, you know, what we do and the decisions we make, it does affect those around us. And we do need relationships around us. We do have certain advantages, the support system of the church. And so there's a lot to be gleaned just from that. But don't miss the lesson of verse 8. Uh, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And the idea of belonging to Him, the idea of possession and devotion uh, is a key part of this study. Uh, to turn against that attitude of saying, none of your business, and to understand just how many people are affected by our spiritual decisions, and to understand how great our responsibility is back to our Creator. Uh, and so we start with the, the first point, that it is God's business, what we decide to do, how we decide to live. You know, everything we do concerns God. Everything we do is His business. Nothing is hidden or separate or private from the Creator of all. Uh, he sees all that we do, uh, even knows what we think. You know, you can hide your thoughts from anyone around, but you can't hide your thoughts from God. Uh, in Hebrews 4, beginning at verse 12, we see a well-known verse about Scripture. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now you think about this principle. Uh, we all know that God's Word is powerful. 
Uh, We all know that the Bible, His Word, has power. It contains in it the teaching of the Gospel, the message about Jesus, and how we can live a life of faith serving Him. But I wonder if you've considered the Word of God as it's described here, as a discerner of your thoughts, as a discerner of the intents of our hearts, the deepest, most private, most inner, most intimate part of ourselves and our concerns, the Word of God lays all that open. God in His power sees all. And that's what the next verse is all about. Verse 13, No creature is hidden from His sight. All things are open to God. You are an open book. I am an open book. And of course, it is God's business to see how we're living. To see what uh, His creation is about. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, we go a little deeper on this idea. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20 says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Uh, Now looking at the previous verse from Hebrews, someone might say, well, why? Why am I an open book before God? Why does He get to, to read me like that, to see the most inner part of me? Well, because we've been purchased. Uh, You know, not just the fact of creation, uh, master and servant by right of creation, but by the fact of purchase for those in the church. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Uh, You know, considering one day that we will stand before Him, we ought to care that He cares. And what He considers of us, it is God's business, uh, how we live and the decisions we make. And you can see here we have a responsibility to glorify Him. Uh, And so if we are going to serve God with reverence and fear, if we are going to have any hope of salvation, uh, it will matter to us how our conduct affects Him, how He views it. Uh, And we'll, of course, say that it is God's business. But you can see a clue, a hint here in this verse to where we're going next. Uh, It says you were bought at a price. Uh, What was that price? Well, of course, it was Jesus. And so, number two, we say that it is Christ's business how we choose to live and the decisions that we make. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, it speaks to Christ on the throne. Uh, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Uh, It is from this position of power and authority that we see our Lord execute judgment. Uh, And it is inescapable. Uh, The language at the beginning there of verse 10, we must all appear before that judgment seat. None are excused. Uh, You know, if you were excused from that, you could say none of his business. But since we're all answering to him as judge, it is his business. It is his concern what we do. Uh, Notice also the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body. Our actions, our decisions mentioned specifically here according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Uh, See, everything is Christ's business. Everything we do, every decision we make. We belong to Him. The way we live reflects that. And and yes, our actions really do speak volumes. Uh, You know, revealing what that innermost part of us is, what is in your heart, what is in your private thoughts, that comes out in your actions. Uh, And of course, it has reference back to Christ as judge and His teaching, the Word. Uh, In John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Uh, and so you pair these two verses together. In John 12, 48, Jesus is talking about being judged by the word. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we see the teaching that Christ is on the judgment seat and we have to answer for what we do in this life. Uh, well, you put it together, we are answering for what we've done in relation to God's word. Uh, whether good or bad, well, that is whether we have obeyed or disobeyed God's Word? Have we lived faithfully? Have we acknowledged Jesus as the master of our lives uh, and changed from an old way of sin based on the knowledge of Christ, based on salvation through His blood? Uh, You can see much the same in Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. Mark 8, 38 says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. Uh, And I would submit to you this morning that if someone says it is none of Christ's business how I live, uh, then this exactly is how they could be described. Uh, Someone being ashamed of or rejecting, turning away from, neglecting, having disdain for the Word of God. Uh, And you can see the end result. Christ says, I will be ashamed of Him uh, uh, when coming in glory with the holy angels. And so in that last great day, the day of judgment, 
Uh, if there is to be any hope of salvation, we better know that what we do is Christ's business, uh, that it does concern Him and that we do have to answer for that. Uh, now, the third, we have to finish out the Trinity. Uh, it is the Holy Spirit's business, what we do and how we act. Uh, and there's a lot of great verses to describe this relationship. I'm going to start in Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Uh, now this has direct reference back to where we just left. Christ talking about His Word, uh, and to not be ashamed of His Word, but to be a diligent follower of that Word, to receive it and to obey it. Uh, well, here in Ephesians 4.30, when it talks about grieving the Holy Spirit of God, or causing sorrow, or offending, uh, that is to reject the Bible. Uh, the Bible is the product of the Holy Spirit, of His inspiration. He revealed the Word for us so that we would follow it, so that we would know how to live. And so when we transgress, we do grieve the Spirit. We do offend the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this is more serious when you consider where this journey began. Uh, when obeying the Gospel, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit according to the promise of Acts 2.38. Uh, you know, this gift is explained a little bit further in 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, this is a great passage to remember on this point. Uh, about it being the Holy Spirit's business or having to answer for that. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Uh, now, first you might notice that phrase at the end, you are not your own, which is very similar to our scripture reference, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's, uh, we are not our own. But as it's described here a little further, uh, our body, the body of the Christian, is the temple that the Holy Spirit dwells in. In this day and age, that is God inhabiting us. And it is according to that promise from Acts 2.38. Uh, notice also it says, The Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. Uh, God giving a gift, a part of Himself to dwell in us. Uh, this being part of that seal for the day of redemption, as we already read in Ephesians 4.30. Uh, part of that promise for the New Testament age, for the priesthood. Uh, and so how serious a thing is it if we have a part of God dwelling in us and we say it's none of the Holy Spirit's business how I live or what decisions I make. I don't have to answer to God for that. Uh, we well, can see it'd be a serious problem. Uh, in fact, a little bit earlier in 1 Corinthians from chapter 3, if you look there to verse 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Notice verse 17. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Uh, now what does it mean to defile the temple? Well, as he says here in the context as well as in chapter 6, uh, our body is the temple. And so the decisions we make during this life while we inhabit these bodies can have serious consequences. And that we do have to give answer for that. And so you piece together what we've had through this section. If the Bible is a product of the Holy Spirit, then it is from God, and it must be respected. Uh, when we reject the Word of God, we put ourselves at odds or grieve uh, the Holy Spirit, and it is the business of the Holy Spirit how we live if we hope to have that seal of redemption uh, and that continued promise of salvation. And so through all of this, whether we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit, it is, of course, the Master's business how the servants live and conduct themselves. We do have to answer to God. Uh, now that covers the part of this discussion that is man to God. Now we have to go a little deeper into the part of this discussion that is man to man. Uh, within mankind, is it anyone's business how we live and what we do? Uh, well, you'll find biblically it is. Uh, it is the church's business, what we decide to do, how we decide to live. Uh, now, of course, as we talk about the church, this is the body of the saved. It has reference not just to the universal church, all Christians everywhere and throughout time, uh, but also to the local church, the local congregation. Uh, Galatians 6 is where we begin this discussion. Galatians 6, verse 1 and 2. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, now there's a lot of other verses that we could have gone to in the New Testament to talk about this point. 
Uh, you know, so many verses that describe one anothering, uh, whether it's confessing our faults to one another or praying for one another, comforting one another. There's so much in the scriptures that has to deal with that. But notice what's said here. In verse 1, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, uh, meaning he's transgressed God's law, he's caught up in sin, you who are spiritual, uh, now of course you who are spiritual would describe those who are the church, those who are saints, those who have God dwelling in them, who are seeking to live righteously. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Uh, the last part there in verse 2 makes it even more plain. Bear one another's burdens. Uh, presented as a command, as the imperative. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Which means, if we are not bearing one another's burdens, if we're not seeking to restore those caught up in sin, we are not fulfilling the law of Christ. And that's made clear there. And so as brothers or sisters in Christ, we ought to care about the souls of other brethren. Uh, sometimes we are so in love with privacy that we disregard commands for New Testament Christians. Uh, now, I like privacy as much as the next person, but to a certain extent, we're to be involved with each other. We're to be a family. We're to have that closeness. Uh, now, I'll caution you not to fall off the other end of this cliff. This is not a license to be a busybody, but we are obligated to seek to restore someone overtaken in sin. Uh, brethren are instructed to think about one another, to be concerned, to be involved in each other's lives, and to care about each other's conduct. Uh, and so it is the church's business how we decide to live, what we decide to do. Uh, you can also see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians 8, if you look to, to verse 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 8, 12 and 13 says, But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Uh, now this context, similar to what we saw in Romans 14, talks about eating meat offered to idols. Uh, and so if you have a brother or sister in Christ who maybe just came out of the worship of that particular idol, it wounds their conscience to think of eating meat offered to that false god, even though there's nothing in it. Uh, here he says, I will never again eat meat. Uh, if that's going to be a stumbling block, even though there's nothing in it, I'm going to go out of my way to make this right with my brother or sister, even inconveniencing myself so that I won't be a spiritual hindrance to them. Uh, now, I think, looking to myself as well, we need more of this type of attitude in the church today. Uh, you know, where is that self-sacrifice to say, I'll go out of the way, I'll be inconvenienced, I'll be self-sacrificing to help someone else's spiritual situation, to not be a stumbling block or a hindrance to them in any way. Uh, my business is to make sure I'm not doing anything that might hurt someone else. Uh, and the minute I find that I've done wrong, I need to try and make that right, to do what I can so that it doesn't get in their way of a right relationship with God. Uh, and so if your brethren care about you, uh, they're going to make it their business to help you, uh, even at the risk of hurting a friendship, even at the risk of uh, you know, hurting someone's feelings. We have to be after what is right, uh, what is just according to God's law. Uh, and although it's difficult, we need to, to try our best to be thankful when brethren care enough to come to us with their concerns. You know, instead of throwing up that wall, like we talked about being immediately defensive, how dare you question me and what I've done, uh, to realize what's at the heart of it is love and care and concern. Uh, even if they're wrong, the motives there uh, are absolutely loving. To want you to be right with God, how can you fault someone for that? It's a wonderful thing. Uh, and so to seek out the truth of the matter according to Scripture and make sure we're all walking right with Him. Uh, remember that our behavior reflects upon our brethren. Uh, and it is the church's business that we would support each other in living righteously. Uh, now the next point takes it even further. Uh, it is our neighbor's business. How we choose to conduct ourselves, how we choose to live. Uh, it does concern those even outside the church, even those who have not obeyed the gospel. Uh, we are influencing those around us. Uh, our neighbors, whether we like it or not, we are affecting them. And we're commanded to behave properly toward those who are outside the body of Christ. We set an example. We have to make sure that that is a good and godly example. Light that would lead others to worshiping God rather than something that would detract from their relationship with Him. Uh, and so what we do, to a certain extent, is absolutely our neighbor's business. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4... Uh, you get to see Paul address this a little bit, beginning there in the middle of verse 10. 
But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. Uh, Now you notice part of that list, to mind your own business. He doesn't want them to get too far to the other end where you're a busybody and you're a gossip. And so there is a measure of balance to this. But included in that list, he says to walk properly toward those who are outside. Make sure you have an example for your neighbor, for those outside of Christ, so that they can see godliness there. Uh, It is the business of those around how we conduct ourselves because how many people have been turned off the idea of religion altogether because of a Christian behaving badly. Uh, Now, it's not right and it's not just for them to do this, but they look at that one misstep of that Christian and say, Christianity is wrong. Christ is not for me. The church is corrupt. Uh, Well, sometimes we mess up. We're not perfect, absolutely. Uh, But what we're growing toward is the image of Christ. And we need to promote that truth, that we're all in need of a Savior, and by drawing close to Him, we do have the solution. Not that we will be flawless, but that we know who is flawless, that we will follow the example of our Savior, Jesus. Uh, and so it is the business of our neighbor, how we conduct ourselves. We need to make sure we're being a good example and that we're leading them toward Christ just as others have led us toward Christ. Uh, but also under this idea of our neighbor's business, we need to talk about the role of government. Uh, in Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, uh, we get into the idea of law and order, the idea of authority and power. Uh, how God relates this to physical governments. Romans 13, verse 1 and 2 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Uh, Now, far too many Christians have adopted the attitude I answer to God and no one else. Now in the spiritual realm, I would say absolute agreement. But there are other people you have to answer to. Uh, You think about all the different authority figures that are present in your life. Uh, And not just from the immediate family, but think about the authority of police officers. Think about the authority of local elected officials. Think about the authority of federal officials. Uh, And even uh, governments and organizations around the world. There are authorities that we have to answer to, and the teaching of the New Testament is that when we violate the laws of the land, not only are we accountable to that government whose laws we violated, but we are accountable to God. Uh, Here it says in verse 2, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. Uh, We have to have respect for the authority that there is present because the Bible teaches it is present because of God, by God's will. And so no matter the source, we need to keep in mind uh, how much we can affect the reputation of Christ's church. It is our neighbor's business, whether we talk about some friend that we can influence or whether we talk about the government and the power and authority that's there, we do have to answer for our conduct uh, and when it does concern them how we live. Uh, Now the last one I want to talk about, uh, it is the family's business. Uh, It is our physical family's business how we choose to live and how we choose to conduct ourselves. Uh, And I think this point becomes even more important as society moves further away from the godly picture of family and what it means in those different roles in the home. Uh, If you look to Colossians 3, beginning at verse 18, uh, we have a quick little discussion there on different roles within the family. Colossians 3, starting at verse 18, says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Verse 21 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Uh, and so we have within this list, uh, you know, very quickly, wives, husbands, children, parents. Uh, all brought up, and that's what we see within the home, the, the family that is there. Uh, we begin with, with wives in verse 18 that they would submit to their own husbands. Uh, And with that, I give a word to the husbands that the command to submit is for the wife. Uh, You cannot force someone to submit. You cannot make someone to submit. It goes against the very definition. Uh, But wives will choose to submit when we fulfill our part as husbands to love our wives. Uh, You apply to this the teaching of Ephesians 5 that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. 
Uh, and I don't think any woman would have a problem to submitting with someone who loves them as Christ loved the church and loved mankind. Uh, it continues in verse 20, Children, obey your parents in all things. And this gets back to the picture of authority like we talked about with the government. We also answer to the authority of parents. And in that we have a model. Uh, no model used more often in Scripture to describe God's relationship to mankind than of parent to child. Uh, and so we are to obey our earthly parents. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And then the last part, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Uh, the idea here of raising those children, nurturing them, bringing them up uh, in the teaching of the Lord. But sometimes, within the home, this pattern is not followed. Uh, and I don't have to tell you that because it's obvious. Sometimes within the home, there are those who do not want to submit to God's pattern. Uh, and you know, maybe it'll be one part of the family, or maybe each one rejects their role given by God. Uh, but when that happens, what should our reaction be? What do we do in those circumstances where the family is not conducting itself as it ought to? Uh, you know, we'll take it a step further. Is it the business of a husband that his wife would follow God's instructions? And vice versa. Is it the business of the wife that her husband would follow God's instructions? Absolutely. And so you go back to the original point, none of your business, how I live and what I do. Well, yes, it is your family's business. When you think about marriage, that husband and wife really depend on each other to be a support system to live godly. Uh, and what you want in your mate, in your spouse, is just like Adam and Eve. Eve created to be a help suitable to him. And so husband and wives to help each other to have that heavenly home to help each other to live godly, to help each other to raise godly children. All of this built into that relationship. And so, of course, it's the business of each one that the other would live godly. There's a powerful effect there in the home. Uh, too often we've seen a, a husband or a wife uh, who struggles in living godly and raising godly children because their spouse is not pulling their weight, not living righteously, not following God's instructions and fulfilling their role as they should. Uh, God doesn't want it to be this way. Uh, and you can take it even further when you think about parents and children. Uh, you know, is it a parent's business that their child live righteously? Absolutely. But don't miss out. It is also the child's business that their parents live righteously. Because again, they are depending on each other. Uh, and a child is hurt when they don't have the proper discipline and love that is shown, exemplified by our God. And parents are hurt when children take that love, that discipline, and rebel against it, continue to fight. And we've seen that picture uh, portrayed by God and His people many times throughout history. Uh, and so it is the business of each group. They do concern each other how they ought to live. Uh, and again, it's not a license to be a busybody, and we ought not to micromanage each other. But when a child is in danger, or when a marriage is in jeopardy, we need to do what we can to save that relationship. Uh, to do the best, as is our part, to live peaceably and to live righteously. Uh, and then also in this discussion, you know, to what degree do we, as a church family, make it our concern to help promote godly families? Uh, to help promote the idea of godly marriages and to help those uh, who have gone off the path and, and have gotten into spiritual troubles. You know, if we take the attitude of, it's none of your business and, and what you do is none of my business, we're not going to be able to provide that help and support. And I think we're designed to do that based on the teaching of the Bible. Uh, and so with this discussion, we live in a society where people want to be totally dependent. Uh, they want to have this closed-off attitude, the total privacy to say, well, I'll say, hey, how are you doing? But we're never going to take it past that. Uh, they make their decisions, choose their actions, and you better not call them to account for it. You better not question them. And even if God were to question them, they say, you've no right. Uh, maybe you've heard before the idea of someone saying, even if Jesus was here right now and questioned me on this, I'd tell them the same thing. None of your business. Leave me alone. It's a terrible problem. And more and more people are falling into this line of thinking. They want to answer to no one, to serve God on their own terms, or to just live life as their own master. Say, none of your business. Uh, but there are a lot of problems when you compare that attitude with the teaching of the Bible. Uh, first of all, as it relates to God. Uh, we know, of course, that it is God's business how we live, uh, not just by right of creation, uh, but in what we see God do for us. Uh, most of all, there Christ and His sacrifice, and it is, of course, Christ's business 
what we do and how we choose to live. And for those who obey the gospel to receive uh, the Holy Spirit of God in us. And it is, of course, the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit's business, what we would decide to do. Uh, but this also relates to how we treat each other. Uh, whether it's those within the church family or those who are outside, our neighbors or whoever we happen to meet, it is their business how we live. It does affect them. It does have a, a powerful concern on their life. And then, of course, our families, uh, our homes, and, and what is meant to be present there, what is meant to be beneficial uh, as we are raised and nurtured and learning about God's truth. Uh, you know, no person is an island. Uh, and especially when it comes to spiritual matters, don't seek independence. Uh, understand support is there for a reason. Understand that you stand before God. He is the judge and will be judged based on what we've done according to the words of Christ. Uh, you know, there's a lot that fits under this umbrella and in this study. Today, we've just scratched the surface. We've just barely touched it. Uh, but I encourage you to dig out a little bit further into some of these ideas. Uh, see for yourself what the Bible has to say about being involved, being concerned, and seeing uh, that we can't live with the attitude that says, it's none of your business what I do or how I live. We are connected. We are connected to our God, and we are connected to each other. Uh, if you're not yet a Christian this morning, the opportunity is available to you to have your sins washed away in the blood of Christ, to rise as a new creature who is ready to serve Him. And if you're a Christian who's led sin back into your life for whatever reason, uh, you know that God is ready to forgive. We're ready to work alongside you. Uh, if we can help you in any way, we'd invite you to come as together we stand and sing.